brought my water today for anybody who's seen me preach before. <laughs> I know Steve's on standby back there to go run and get me something. So. Would you pray with me for a minute? Lord of justice and mercy, we come to you this day seeking your healing and reconciling love. Help us to be open to your word, your presence, your compassion. Clear our hearts of those things which block your will. Keep us focused on your enabling power so that we, having been healed, may fully serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're talking about kindness, and when Pastor Cheryl first uh, got a hold of me to see if I could preach today, I was you know, excited about it, but she said it was the, the fruit was patience, and I panicked. <laughs> But then within a few minutes, she wrote back and she's like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, it's about kindness. I'm like, okay, well, I can do that. <laughs> Patience, no. Uh, so one of the unique things about, uh, that I found about being a Methodist um, that I didn't really have before in my uh, faith life was the responsive readings that we do or the responsive, um, you know, sayings we do. I wanted to try a couple of those this morning. Um, and I'll say the first part, and you say the second. And this was especially appropriate. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us read. Be glad. That's right. Here's another one we do. He is risen. Right. Peace be with you. How about this one? May the force be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> maybe maybe you should stick to the script in church. I don't. <laughs> at least it wasn't lightning. So I've got one more, and this is not a Methodist or church saying, but if there's any children of the '80s, listen to this and, and, and see if you can uh, respond to this one with me. See how many people can remember. It's just one word. Be kind. Rewind. Does anybody remember? So if you grew up around the same time I did, you'll remember how exciting it was when the VCR came out and you could go down to your local convenience store and rent movies. Uh, so you didn't have to watch what, just, what was on the three channels that were available. Every small town had one of these and the big towns got like Blockbuster, uh, which had more better movies. But when you rented the tape, there were a long list of rules, like um, it has to be back in 24 hours, you're gonna pay for it. Um, there's a late fee, if you break it or jam it up in your VCR, you bought it. And every tape had a sticker on it that said, be kind, rewind. The kids today may not get this, but um, there was nothing more frustrating than renting a movie and popping it in the VCR, and you either saw some critical scene in the movie that revealed the plot twist or you saw the final credits. So you turn the, li you know, turn the lights off, sit in your recliner, grab your popcorn, start the VCR, and the credits are rolling. You gotta turn everything back on, walk over, punch some buttons, and then wait while it just whine and whine and whine for like 10 minutes. Personally, I can't stand missing the first few minutes of a movie, and this kind of started I think when I was in about fourth grade, and we didn't go to movies a lot, we had gone to visit my grandma and we're driving home, and my parents noticed that The Empire Strikes Back was playing on uh, the movie theater. Uh, and they decided at the last minute to, uh, I don't know what that is, but anyway. <laughs> well, hey, let's just, you know, let's pull in there and, and go watch it. And, um, you know, it was exciting for us, and, and we walk in and sit down. And we missed about 15 minutes of the beginning of this movie. And I hadn't seen the original Star Wars, so it didn't ma matter a whole lot. But as we walked in, we walked in on the scene when Han Solo and Princess Leia were kissing. And being in fourth grade, I was already ready to turn around and walk out. I didn't want to see any of that nonsense. And, and just imagine how upset I would have been if we had walked in on, Luke, I am your father. It would have ruined the whole thing for me, you know. So from that time, I can't even, if I miss the opening scene of a movie, it, it, it's just not good for me. So I believe in order to truly understand any story or any movie or any film, whether it's a real life event or a fictional event, it's impossible to have the context unless we know the full story. And that's where the rewinding comes in. 
Can you imagine trying to understand a TV show like The Sopranos, your friends, you know, they hound you for years. Oh, you gotta watch this show, there's any number of them, Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or whatever. And you finally decide to watch this show and see what it's all about. You turn it on and you see Tony Soprano getting up from the chair at the diner and walking to the restroom. It would just ruin the entire thing. And you would judge the entire story on that. Yet in real life, we often rely on tiny little bits of information or tiny flashes of news that are often tainted by opinions or agendas or politics. And we make sweeping judgments based on these little flashes that we see throughout the day. Oftentimes these situations, good or bad, are, are, are about people we don't know or situations we don't know, places we've never been, you know, things we've never thought about, but we're, we're always ready to jump in on Facebook or social media and make some sweeping statement of opinion about them. So when I first found out I'd be uh, preaching about kindness, I had a few weeks. We went on vacation, we had a wonderful time, and I thought this is going to be easy, and I, you know, I ran the sermon through my head several times. And then we get back to this week, and suddenly talking about kindness is not so easy. This is one of the most unkind weeks that we can remember in recent history. There's been very little kindness in the world this week or even this year. We see kindness after tragedy happens, but we see very little kindness before tragedy happens. And I think that's a tragedy in itself. And for all the unkindness we've witnessed in the news, there's another more insidious type that finds its way into our lives through arguments, debates, social media. For me, I get caught up in this, it's, it's much easier and less frustrating for me to get into some heated political argument on Facebook than it is to read a statement about how Christians should act in a certain situation or what the Bible says about this situation or who's right, or who's wrong, or who's gonna be condemned. So, that's not anything new. This has been going on as long as Christianity's been around. People using weapons against others, I mean using uh, words as weapons against others. Long before Facebook, there was Paul. And anybody that's ever heard me preach before probably has heard me say that I don't like Paul. He's the author of the letter to the Galatians, and this fruit of the Spirit's discussion appears in the Galatians. There are things, let me, let me just say this, there are things that Paul says, like the fruits of the Spirit, that I love. And my favorite part of the Bible is the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, love is kind. That entire, it's amazing, it sums up everything about my faith, and Paul wrote that. But a lot of the stuff he writes, I don't like But whether I like him or not, he arguably had a greater effect on the spread of Christianity than anyone else but the apostles and Jesus. His letters make up the bulk of the New Testament, more than half, and his words have guided Christianity for, you know, two millennia. And unlike some of the people in the Bible, we know a lot about Paul. There's a lot of historical records. Um, and despite the fact that he contradicts himself a lot, and sometimes he's mean, and sometimes he contradicts the apostles, and sometimes he says things that are different than what Jesus said, we often fast forward in the Bible story to one of Paul's letters whenever we have a crisis or an argument, and we do the cut and paste, right? That's our Christian argument to any situation on Facebook, is to go find... One of Paul's verses that's the answer to all of our questions. And the words that precede that argument, the three words often, are the Bible says. So Paul's right about a great number of things. He's right about the fruits of the Spirit. Kindness is a fruit of a life sustained by the Holy Spirit. It comes naturally when you're living in the Holy Spirit, and it comes abundantly. And there's, a, there's an infinite supply. You don't run out of kindness. You don't run out of love. You don't have to divide your kindness among people, divide your love among people, divide your compassion. It multiplies, and God gives you an endless supply. 
But kindness has many definitions, and Strong's Concordance, I found by accident this week looking at this topic, that one definition of kindness is described as gracefully tolerating people who test your patience. There's another kind of kindness, too. Another kind of kindness are corrections done out of love. Not corrections done out of I'm right or I win, but corrections done because you love the person you're trying to correct. It's sort of a tough love, and, and I have a little bit of tough love this morning of my own. And I'll just start it by saying, I'm going to use this as an example, I think three of the worst words a Christian can use are, the Bible says. And it doesn't matter if you're refuting an argument, it doesn't matter if you're offering someone advice or comfort or answering a question that they ask, it's a disservice to Christianity by taking a few words, speaking as a Christian with authority and saying, this book says X, Y, Z. Because you know what, this is really not a book. And as Methodists, we're taught that this is a library. Methodists don't often accept things at face value. Our theology is guided by scripture, but it's also guided by reason and tradition and belief. And we put all of these things together and we take this library. This library is a collection of history books, law books. It's got literature, it's got poetry, it's got songs, it's got parables, it's got gospels, it's got prophecies. And it's got letters from Paul. And these letters were from Paul to a, a group of people. And as uh, United Methodists, we take this library not as one total complete thing, but we take this library and see it as the sweeping story from beginning to end, written by men who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, sometimes imperfect. But we see this sweeping story over thousands of years about how God wins, how God acts in the world, sometimes in tough situations, but how God's Son is the living Word of God and how His life is a testament about how God affects our lives and how the Holy Spirit brings the fruits into our lives. So it often seems to me in these arguments, <laughs> going back to the Facebook thing, it often seems to me in these arguments that when a Christian wants to make a point or put somebody down or correct them, the Bible only has two books in it, Leviticus and Romans. That's where they always come from. That's all there is. You know, it's either Leviticus or Romans. That's where all the good quotes are. So back to Paul, I think it's important, as influential as Paul was, and as, as amazing as some of his writings are, he says himself that he never met Jesus the man. He claims an epiphany, but he doesn't elaborate on it. And I found it interesting that the, the story of Paul being struck blind on the road was not one that Paul told himself. It was a story that was told in Acts. It was written by a different author. Paul does claim an epiphany, he claims be the recipient of the true good news. He claims that he receives authority from Christ and that our salvation is through faith. And that's, that's a primary guide for us today. Biblical scholars believe that, so Paul has a number of letters, I, th I think it's 14 in the New Testament, and most scholars are in agreement that seven to nine of these were written by Paul himself. And they agree especially on Galatians. It's never been called into question. And most people believe that unlike some of his other letters, he wrote it himself. In fact, at the end of Galatians, after our verse about kindness, Paul says, you know, you know that this is coming from me because look at how big the letters are that I'm writing. His, his eyes were going bad. He's like, this is how strong I believe in what I'm saying. And you know it's me because I'm writing in large print. So we can see in this letter, before we get to the fruits of the Spirit, we see in this letter, man, it's very angry. And he's angry because he has gone to this area of Galatia, and he has planted these churches, and he's taught people about salvation through faith. And he's taught people that, you know, the law is not something that will save you anymore. You need to live by Jesus' message. 
and he gets the point across, and he goes back home, and he finds out that there are these, this other group called the Juda- Judaizers who have come back through and said, you know, Paul's not right. You actually do need to live by the law. You need a Sabbath. You need um, the particular issue of Galatians. And I didn't know we were going to have kids in here today. <laughs> I have to turn it down. But there's a particular issue in Galatians about body parts and whether God, you know, wants a certain activity to happen before you can be saved. And Paul's really mad about that. And he doesn't use kindness for the first four or five chapters before he gets to the flowery language. He's condemning these people to destruction for eternity. He's, you know, very angry, very angry man. He's upset with the Galatians for listening. He's upset at these other people. He's even upset at Peter, who didn't really have anything to do with the story. He just said, you know, I even told Peter he was wrong. So reading a small verse from Galatians doesn't do justice to the letter as a whole, and reading the letter of Galatians doesn't do justice to our Bible, our library as a whole. But the good verses are always the ones that are remembered. Even without context, without the surrounding text, the fruits of the Spirit make sense to us today. There was a Peanuts comic strip one time in which Linus came home from school and Charlie Brown asked him how his day was and Linus answered, it was okay, we're studying the letters of St. Paul. And Charlie Brown asked him, well, what do you think about them? And Linus says, I felt like I was reading somebody else's mail. So after starting out, Paul with a few, hey, look at me and I'm not lying and I'm the only one with the truth, which is like a typical Facebook conversation, he gets to the good news. He even turns a little bit Trump in chapter 5 right before he gets to the fruits of the Spirit. And I'll try to paraphrase this. Your brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must follow some activities of the law, why am I being persecuted by these people? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, Nobody would be offended. I just wish those troublemakers who want you to mutilate yourselves would go mutilate themselves. <laughs> a very unkind verse. But we only have to look around ourselves and find out 2,000 years later that things haven't, haven't changed much, you know? This is the same kind of language. We see this on TV. We see it in debates. We see it in Facebook. We see it in the news. And even though it's a less than stellar start to the letter, Paul does wrap it up with what is the most important part of this letter. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's a lot of them. And he says the important part, there is no law against these things. Whatever else you think you need to do, these are the things that will come into your life through the cross. Fortunately, this is a lesson to, and I'm going to go off the rails for a second. This is a lesson my wife taught me, and it, and it applies here. Whenever we're on vacation, or we've been cooped up, or it's, you know, we're in the house for a long time, and I'm frustrated, the boys are frustrated, and everybody's, you know, at each other. Vacation is a perfect example. And then, you know, we get out at uh, a place that we're going to visit, and everybody's happy. And everybody is seeing these wonderful sites like national parks or whatever. When I'm getting frustrated beforehand or afterward, you know, one time I asked her, I'm like, why aren't you frustrated? The boys in the back, they're arguing. I don't like this situation. I'm frustrated. And she goes, because later on, when you think back to this vacation, you're not going to remember the fights in the car. You're going to remember getting out and looking at mountains. The good parts are what we remember. And the good part of this letter is what's remembered and passed on. So what's the relevance for us today? I think the lesson for today is for us to realize how much our hateful rhetoric makes these unkind times even worse. Too often we turn on the TV and there's an incendiary story playing and we don't take time to rewind. Even if we can rewind, there's some stories we can't rewind. We don't take time to consider the entire story before we react. Every person that we meet, every person we talk to on social media, 
has a story that we don't know about. We don't get to rewind and know their story. But if we respect that and treat each other with kindness, we avoid hurting people with our words. So I think the reason I'm so critical of Paul is because he reminds me of myself, and anybody who's seen my arguments on Facebook will say, well, you did the same thing. <laughs> I'm right. I'm the only one that knows the truth. <laughs> the Constitution says. <laughs> At least Paul wears his emotions on his sleeve. Through his anger, his tough love, he tells us that Jesus prefers us to be kind rather than right. It's especially important right now. Our words and actions are kind and come easily when we're living in the Spirit, and we can be assured they're fruits of the Spirit and not fruits of our mind. If our words are unkind and our minds are closed, that's not God, that's not the Holy Spirit working in our lives. This is a lesson for myself as much as it is for others. The time in my life when I feel truly alive, when I feel every single one of these fruits, is usually after I get back from work. Because for weeks or months afterward. It's easy to be kind and patient with people, you know, when you're filled up with that. And when I feel bitter or angry or I care only about winning a stupid argument, I don't feel the fruits of the Spirit. I feel like a James Taylor song. There's a song called That Lonesome Road, and I'm not going to sing it, but I'll read you a couple of words from it, and this is how I feel. Walk down that lonesome road all by yourself. Don't turn your head back over your shoulder, and only stop to rest yourself when the silver moon is shining high above the trees. If I had stopped to listen once or twice, if I had closed my mouth and opened my eyes, if I had cooled my head and warmed my heart, I'd not be on this road tonight. So in conclusion, we often find ourselves on lonesome roads. I know I do. I know Paul did. The important thing to realize is that kindness goes a long way in bringing us back, turning us around on the lonesome road. Sometimes, though, the need to be right, the need to be loud, the need to win can put us on a lonesome road that only goes one way. And people's patience runs out and they're not really interested in helping us come back. So if I can say anything on this topic, and it's, it's not going to, like, kindness, yay, like I thought it was going to be. But if I can say anything, I would say, let's try to be kind. Let's try to rewind the story a little bit when we're dealing with others. Let's not get distracted by words and actions so that we forget the entire story. And if you can't find... This is for me as much as anything. If you can't find any other way to relate or any other words to say, just listen to Jesus. Turn around, leave town, and wipe the dust off your feet. In Jesus' name.